And yeah, Russ, you can start. Thanks very much. Um, so um, let me share my screen. <clears throat> um, I don't think any of you have been in a course with me before. If I'm wrong about that, is there anybody who's had one of my courses in another, like last year, anytime? Hopefully not, because you'd be really bored at the beginning. Uh, maybe you will be anyway, but hopefully not. Um, um, Valerie, you were in a course? Yeah, okay. Which one were you in? Um, also the presentation skills seminar. The, the, the normal one, right? Not the, not the <laughs> short one. Okay, so Valerie, if you want, you Maybe can go you take can. a coffee break for the first hour uh, because we're gonna do mostly what we did the last time. You're welcome to stay, obviously, too. You're an expert already. So, uh, but otherwise, um, like I said, the okay. theoretical part is mostly the same. So, if you want, come back around three thirty and, and join us then. Okay. Um, so, uh, first of all, let me tell you just a little bit about myself. I've been at the MDC for thirteen years now. I think I think it's thirteen, maybe fourteen. My gosh. And um, I started as a science writer. So I was working in the communication. We didn't have a communications department then. I was writing articles for the internet and I wrote actually two books about the MDC, which are still around somewhere. And if anybody is desperately looking for a good thing to go to sleep to, you can come by and pick up one of these books. Um, and I've written eight or nine other books about biology and, and done all kinds of things. Um, when I started to work with scientists, I, my, I'm not a scientist by training. I was a writer and a teacher. And when I started to work with scientists and started to write about molecular biology, this was 25 years ago, um, I was immediately asked to, to um, help the scientists with their own writing and communication tasks. And I came across a lot of problems and what I realized over the years was I, I basically realized a couple things that are really important, and that is um, I, I believe that science and communication are profoundly connected to each other in a way that most people don't realize or don't understand. And because that's not recognized, um, it has all kinds of effects, not only on the way that we communicate, it makes communication tasks hard and stressful, but it also affects the quality of your research. And it's taken me a long time to kind of understand that process, why there should be any connection between giving talks and writing papers and trying to do it well and doing good research. But now that I think I've come to understand that a bit, um, I've discovered that there's all kinds of payoffs for doing this. So what we're gonna do in this, theoretical part this 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 afternoon this first part is i'm going to try to show you how i think these two things are connected to each other why it's important that we do this and it's not just we're not just trying to get you to wrap your science up in a pretty package either in writing or talking or whatever and um probably we're going to get to know each other really well over the time of your phd because i'm teaching lots of courses and my job is now not to write about science, but to teach these kinds of courses. And so this theory, it's all gonna start with this. And if you've done it one time, you don't need to do it again. So if you join one of the other courses later, um, Valeria was already excused from the first part. Um, so let me just repeat that again. I think that science and communication are con connected in profound ways that most people misunderstand. This has an effect on your research and if you, pay some attention to this. And if you learn this kind of strategy that we're gonna talk about today, it has all kinds of benefits. Now, the way we're gonna do this is, the first, the first part of this is we're gonna do, we're gonna explore what I call your inner laboratory. And I'll tell you a little bit about what I think that means. Um, and then that's a, a system that you've built in your head that you use to do all the stuff that you're doing in the lab, in the real lab. Um, then we're going to take some ideas that we've approached in that, and we're going to use it to, to develop a real simple, effective way to 
do some communication tasks like the presentation you have to give. And also this method that I'm gonna to try to show you, it, it also helps you know whether you're doing it well or whether you're having problems and it helps you kind of benchmark it and study it along the way and watch this process. And then we're gonna practice it. And the way we're gonna practice it is in the second part, we're gonna do some breakout rooms and do a couple of exercises. Um, but then you're gonna give the talk and that talk is a really great opportunity to put some of these ideas into practice. Now, the reason why this is so important in my opinion is because every scientist spends a lot of their day, every day communicating in some way. I mean, you know, you write papers, you give talks, you apply for grants, you send emails, you collaborate with people. And a lot of times those people, they may be experts specifically from your field, but also just in your group, you may have people who are from different backgrounds. And, and there, if you have any kind of basic problems in communication, they're gonna get real serious and they're gonna cause a problem. The biggest reason why people might have trouble with this is just in most cases, um, European, at least European education systems, they don't pay very much attention to this. If you come from America or the UK, you have to give talks and write all the time, starting from the moment you decide to become a scientist and your professors give you really great feedback about it. Um, but if you don't come from one of those places, usually you haven't had a lot of chances to do that. And that's really bad because it's an essential skill. Um, a lot of you are not native speakers. If there are native speakers in this group, that would be interesting for me because there's other things I'd like to talk to you about. But so you may have some English problems. I found that that's not the biggest deal though. Um, I started as a language teacher and when I started to work with scientists, um, for me it was like I was hoping that I could just teach them English, but that wasn't the problem at all. Um, when I was looking at what people wrote and how they give talks, there were all, all these weird kinds of problems that came up that I didn't really understand because you would think that experts were really good at dealing with these things. So for example, a lot of times I would see a text and it was real hard for me as, as even as an educated, re relatively intelligent person to be able to tell the difference between what was kind of a main point and what was a detail. Um, a lot of times a scientist would throw out a piece of information and they wouldn't have any context for that information. Um, they would jump like right from telling me how many people died of some terrible disease to some molecule doing something in a cell, wind signaling or something. Um, a lot of times in talks and papers, there were these, I couldn't connect things. There were gaps or jumps in the logic. And at first I thought, okay, well, is it, this is just because I'm not getting the normal sort of language cues that we get when we, when we build an argument. But then I realized that people actually were kind of jumping from place to place in their heads and I wasn't, it was hard to tell whether they understood the logic of what they were talking about. And the biggest problem that people seem to have in every part of life, and especially scientists when they try to communicate, is just finding the easiest, simplest, clearest way to say something. Um, I'm, if, if you come from a sort of classic particularly German, but there are other countries that do it too. If you come from a classic education system, your professors may have told you this horrible thing. And that is, well, you know, if you can understand me, that's then you won't think I'm smart. So I have to be really confusing because otherwise you won't think I'm smart. And actually it's the opposite way around. It takes, you have to be a lot smarter to take a complicated idea and make it understandable for somebody else than just to muddle around in your brain and say things anyway and, and talk about them in any way that you like. Now, these problems aren't universal. I've, I've had the chance during my career to talk to 15 Nobel Prize winners, I think. And three of them are actually personal friends and, and that's kind of funny, but anyway, that's a different story. But, but those guys tend to be really good at communicating their science and also the excellent, excellent scientists that I know at the MEDC and lots of other places they tend to be very good at this. They may not be really good at teaching you how to do it, or they may not have time to, but, and, and so all the way from the very beginning, I was asking myself this question, is there a connection between 
being able to communicate really well and being able to do really good science. And I think there is, but it, it just took me a long time to kind of figure out why that should be the case. And, and people who work in, the, in science communication, you know, who do this professionally like me, we see this all the time. There's a real difference between somebody who's great at this and great at science and somebody who's not. And it, it doesn't have to do with where they get published and things like that. There's a connection there too, but anyway, so, so as I was struggling with all these things and struggling with the problem of trying to figure out some way to teach people how to do it better, because I was supposed to be able to do that, um, I decided to kind of study this problem. And, and it, it took me a long time, but, but I spent about five years and I kind of decided to do this scientific approach to this problem. And that is, so, you know, if you're, if you're studying flies or mice or whatever, then you know there's a strategy of, if you want to understand how the system works, you disrupt it. So, you know, we look at mutations and we know that if we see a mutation, it can tell us something about the healthy function of a gene. And so I thought maybe I can do the same thing with problems in communication. Maybe if I look at all the problems I was seeing, these weird things that were happening, maybe I could learn something about how it's supposed to work and how good communication is supposed to work. And so I spent really, I'm, this is ongoing, I'm still doing it and I'm actually getting other people to help me do it now too, but, but I spent five years really doing almost nothing but just kind of analyzing this stuff. And I discovered some things that I didn't expect to see. Um, and the first thing that I found out was that if you're communicating to a group of people who are in your field, if you're writing a paper for a specialist journal, you have certain, you, you can still have certain kinds of problems. And those problems may be harder to see, but they're basically exactly the same kinds of problems that you have if you're trying to talk about science to your grandmother or your grandfather, if they're not molecular biologists. Sometimes I have in the course somebody who says, oh, my grandmother was a famous geneticist. But, but no, if, if that's not the case, if you try to explain your science to somebody who's really not a scientist, you're gonna have certain problems usually. And, and those problems also occur when you talk to experts. Like I said, they're harder to see, but I'm gonna show you some. The, the second thing that I found was that the biggest problems come from the way scientists, two things, the way they think about their work, so the way they think about science in general, and secondly, the goal of whatever they're trying to communicate. So if they're, if they're giving a talk, just ask yourself, why am I giving this talk? What's it supposed to achieve? What's the, what's the goal? What would be a measure of success? And if you're not clear about those things, it's real hard to design a talk or to write something that will achieve its goal. If you don't know why you're doing an experiment, you probably won't understand the results very well. So, the third thing is that problems, just like mutations, they're logical. They're, there's, they don't just happen for random reasons, but there's a real reason behind them. And if you figure out what that logic is, then you can fix it. You have to identify the problem before you can fix it. And when you do fix it, you're changing not only the way we communicate, but you're also helping people think about science in a different way. And I've done had this happen to me personally many many times and that is we have actually made major fantastic improvements in a paper in a research and not only the, the the writing but in the project itself we found gaps we found a better way to think about the thing we've seen that it has bigger implications and and so there can be real payoffs for the research as well and finally just the general question is there's no way to communicate clearly if you don't think clearly. And so we can use these exercises like giving a talk and, and um, writing papers to go into the system in your head and fix it. If there's something wrong with it, we're gonna go in and we can see what's wrong with it and we can take some measures to, you know, we can do some biochemical work there in your brain to kind of, kind of figure it out. Now, all of this goes back to the first major thing that we're gonna talk about today. And that is, it, when, I, when I was doing these things and studying these problems, I realized that scientists have what I call this inner laboratory. And, that, and that's where actually science really happens. You do science in the lab, but two different people could come into this 
same lab and it would do completely different things. Or a person from 50 years ago would come into your lab and do completely different things. And that's because not what's in the lab is different, but it's because what's in your head is different. And I cannot tell you how important this concept is um, because what's in your head is not just a bunch of facts and it's not just a bunch of sort of snapshots of reality. Like it, you, you've got things like ID concepts of cells and concepts of molecules in your head, but they're not the real thing. They're, they're concepts. You don't have real molecules. I mean, you have real molecules in your brain, but you don't have them in your mind. You, you know, probably none of you could tell me the first 50 letters of the sequence of the protein you're studying. You, you don't, you have some composite structure of this. So it's not just a bunch of facts. And, and to show you how complex this is, I'm going to show you start, I'm going to use examples all the way along from, from real papers and real texts and things to show you how this works. And let me just say now that the best way that this course and these courses will work is everything that I'm saying, if, if, if the model that I have of how science communication works and how your brain works when it communicates science, if that model is correct, then everything I'm saying, you'll be able to relate to something that you're doing or something that you're working on. So I'm gonna show you now a little text, and this is a real typical text. It won't be from the field that most of you are in, but you find these kinds of things all over the place. And so every time I show you one of these examples or use a metaphor, try to relate it to your own thing. And, and if you have a question or a comment or whatever, then write that into the chat because we can collect that. And, and I'm looking always for good examples of these things. So here's the first example, and this is, a little text that was just from like the first paragraph of a paper that a friend of mine was writing. And you've seen these millions of times and you just go through it really quickly. Um, cells constantly produce and degrade the molecule beta catenin. Normally it is bound to a complex that's targeted for destruction. Signaling by Wnt blocks the formation of this complex, leaving higher quantities of beta catenin that means it can enter the nucleus and activate target genes. Now, there's a lot of stuff in this text. It's, it's just so oh, I'm sure I'm sure that all of you, you've seen so many of these. And if you're not like just a pure bioinformaticist or something, this text will make sense. We're talking about a transcription factor, right? And all of you should know what a transcription factor is. And you have this pattern in your brain about what that thing is. OK, and that helps you understand this text. But, but if we look at this kind of deeply, then we're gonna see all of the things that are in your head that you have to have to understand what this means. So how do you understand it? If you don't understand it, there's a reason why you can't, and we're gonna figure that out, but you probably do. And when you do understand something, then it's kind of hard to remember why you understand it. I'm gonna show you why you understand this text. And that is, so you have this inner laboratory and, and it not only has pieces of information in it, but it has these concepts and it has metaphors and it has kind of film-like sequences of events. And for me coming from outside science into science, a lot of times it took me a long time to figure this out, but if I couldn't understand somebody, it was because they had something in their head, they had an idea or they had a pattern or they had a film that they were watching in their brain that I couldn't see. And because I couldn't see it, I couldn't understand them. So if you just look at the story, you need to understand some terms, like you need to know what produce and degrade mean, and you need to know what kind of molecule we're talking about. And you need to know how these things are related to each other. And you also need to know something about the geography of the cell. So <clears throat> you may, you should know, but you may not know that Wnt is an external signal, it docks onto a ligand on the cell, on the plasma membrane, then there's a whole cascade of events which trigger complex formation or dissociation, and then it can migrate to the nucleus. So you have the nucleus and so on and so on. So you have to, to understand this, you're drawing on all those patterns and all those concepts, and you're seeing things in a certain order. This is kind of interesting because the order of the text here is not the order in which things actually happen. So you're probably reconstructing. There's all kinds of things going on in your mind. <clears throat> so 
whether you understand this or not depends on how well my inner laboratory, I'm the writer, let's say, and your inner laboratory match up with each other. Whether you have those patterns, whether you have those films, whether you have those concepts. And if something's missing, then there'll be a problem and you won't understand it. So this invisible stuff in our heads is what disrupts communication. So if, if when you're giving your talk, you leave out a link that's in your head that explains something and you expect everybody to know it, but somebody doesn't, then there's gonna be a hiccup and they're gonna get lost. And this happens all the time. It happens, especially if you're talking to somebody in a different field and they don't particularly care that you may not understand them, but you'll also help, it can happen in a lab meeting, it can happen everywhere. And so I needed a name. I was starting to find all kinds of invisible stuff that was messing up communication. And I needed a name for that. And so I thought, okay, what's a name for something invisible that's disruptive? And so I called it a ghost, okay? I'm gonna talk about ghosts a lot here. And what I mean by ghost is something in your brain that you have that I don't have. It's invisible. And if I don't see it, I need to know that thing in order to understand what you're saying. So ghosts can be information, can be just a definition of something, it can be concept, it can be a pattern, or there's all kinds of other things that we know that aren't in the talk. You didn't say it. You didn't, you didn't say what a membrane is like. You didn't say that Wendt needs an extracellular ligand, uh, ligand to dock onto the cell and so on. You didn't sew those things, but if I don't know those things, then I can't understand really what you're saying. And so they're not in the text. That's why we call them invisible, but you have to know those things to understand really what you're trying to say. And learning to see that ghosts are there and identifying them are essential in all kinds of science communication, whether you're talking to your group or your group leader or your colleagues or the public. And once you do see that they're there and you understand how they work, then you have all kinds of power, so to speak. And this raises a really interesting point because when we communicate science, what do you think communication of science is for? What are we actually doing it for? I'm, I'm hoping that you have a con, I mean, you may not have really thought of it that way, but, or you may not have actually raised that question to yourself, but if you were to try to answer that for yourself right now, I'm, right now I want to maybe try to change that answer. I want to make, maybe think of it in a little bit different way. Most science communication is not about sharing your results or sharing facts. It's about debating what facts mean. And that means how they fit into this invisible system of models and patterns and ideas and concepts that you have in your head. So yeah, I'm, I'm giving you the results of my experiment, but what those results mean have to do with how they fit into this system and that system is not necessarily in the text. I haven't described it to you. So I'm gonna give you, so usually these, what we're trying to do with a talk or um, results when we present them, usually what we're trying to do again is to, to show how they fit into a system. And that system usually has to do with models, scientific models. And a lot of times you'd be, you'd be surprised at if, if that's what we're actually trying to do is to explain how certain results fit into this whole system, how many times the system is kind of missing from the talk. And, and if you do, when, when people don't do this course and they get up and give talks, you'd be surprised at how often they just forget to tell us, okay, I'm gonna talk about my experiments, or I'm gonna talk about my project, but I'm not gonna tell you what kind of models that project is in a dialogue with. And if that's missing, it's really, really hard to understand what the hell something is about. And when I read a paper, I'm looking for two things. I'm trying to figure out immediately what's the question the person's answer asking and what does that question mean, which means 
the, que the meaning of the question comes from the models and the hypotheses and the structure that, that generated the question in the first place. And if you can find those two things, you get the paper. If you don't know, if you don't look for them, and if you don't know how to find them, um, that can be complicated. And one of the courses actually we're setting up now is called How to Read a Paper. It's kind of, it'll be kind of like a little journal club. And we're gonna talk about those kinds of things. So anyway, what you're doing when you're listening to a presentation, and hopefully when you're planning a presentation, is you're putting things into the system. And I'm gonna give you a metaphor for that right now. And that is, I'm going to show you a picture. And when I, I promise you that when you see this picture, each of you will see something slightly different. Guaranteed, OK? So here we go. See that picture? I, I said each of you will see something different. And the reason you see something different is some of you know how to play chess, and maybe some of you don't. If you don't know how to play chess, this picture looks really different than to somebody. I can see a couple of faces and they're already trying to figure out the, the next move. <laughs> if you know how to play chess, that's what you do when you see this picture. You say, oh, I wonder, let's see what's going to happen next. And, and you know, that's when you see these pictures is in like a newspaper or whatever. And they say, OK, solve the problem or white to win in five moves or whatever. Um, but but each person sees it differently because our skill level and some people are good players. I'm not a, I'm a really mediocre player, but, but the reason you see something different is because it, when you start to play a little chess, you start building this model of the game and the model describes what the pieces are. It describes their rules that show how they move and how they can move and also describes things that you don't see which are like okay so first white moves and then black moves and then also what's the goal of the game the goal is to capture the other person's king but the game always stops right before that happens which is kind of really interesting right so it, it's it's an interesting situation and and this is a lot like a scientific model in some ways because in scientific models we're not looking at a chessboard but we're looking at a, a system like a cell or um, a biochemical system or an organism or a tissue. And we're trying to figure out what the components are. We're trying to figure out what rules govern their interactions. And we're trying to figure out what the function of this is overall. And without knowing those things, then the things that we do don't really have any meaning. And, and if, if we do know those things, if we, if we do understand sort of the rules of the game or the, the model of the scientific system, then we can say, okay, how did this get here? How did we get to this situation? Is it, is it possible for this to exist in nature? So could this be a real chess game or is there something on it that violates some fundamental, I mean, like are there all, are all the squares, right? The right colors and then the right order and, and are there too many pieces or is this a logical situation? And we can also make predictions about what's, what will happen next. And that's exactly what you do with your scientific models. You, look at a system and you say, okay, we have these components that are interacting in this way. And the way they got here was by following those rules. And then we can use that to make predictions. And so if the model is correct, if the rules that I think of for the game are correct, then I should be able to make those kinds of predictions and I can do experiments. I can make a move and see what happens. It's, it's not a perfect metaphor because, because um, and, and, and remember, if, if, you, if you're showing somebody a chess game, Okay, you may be, you may be, you're not just describing what's on the board, but in science, what you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out the rules and you're trying to see, okay, well, what happens if we add a new piece or, or can, can we do that? Or, or how does this game relate to other games? Or what you're actually trying to figure out is the rules because we don't know them, we're making them up as we go along. And so what we're not trying to do is not just to describe a bunch of facts about the system, but we're trying to figure out what the rules are. And so I'm asking, okay, I have a model of this system. Is that the best description of the game and its rules? And what happens if I discover a new type of RNA? How does that fit into this game? And, and so to speak. So, so when we do science, we're, we're playing games. So it's, it's the reason why we communicate is because we need a game board. Now there are chess masters out there who can figure out how to play chess. They, they don't need a board anymore, but they did when they began. 
they needed to see it when they began or they needed to feel it or whatever. Um, and then they could learn to do it in their heads. And so in science, the papers that we have and the talks that we have, they're like games. And those are the boards that we're playing this bigger game on. And the bigger game is the invisible stuff, the models and, and the patterns and everything. Now, if you go back and look at this text again, and we just ask, okay, what do all these things mean? Then we see that behind this text, there's lots of models. So we have an idea of the system. The system here is a cell and it has components, it has, it has parts, it has like a membrane, it has molecules, it has a nucleus, and it has the relationship between those parts. So what's trying to happen in the system is there's we're trying to activate a set of genes based on this transcription factor and that involves a sequence of events so so there's that and to understand this you have to have this again you have this sort of visual image of the cell and its parts and another ghost is sort of where all these things are so when we talk about a complex um, some people who work on this system obviously they'll know what's in that complex they'll know what the receptor is they'll know they'll know um, where beta catenin fits into this. Um, and <laughs> you'll have something like this in your head. This You don't have this in your head. This is just one way of drawing it. And if you've studied when signaling long enough, then you know it gets a little bit more complicated than that. And actually, you know, these balls and things, they don't really exist, right? They're, it's just a way of showing people all the parts of the system and how they interact. Um, and obviously this is way too simple. It's actually a lot more complicated than that. So this is the kind of network diagram that people are drawing at cells. And this is also fake, right? Because uh, it doesn't have quantities of things and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't show that things happen. And I mean, you can kind of figure out sequences and relationships, but cells don't actually look anything like this. So this is a different kind of model of signaling. In this case, we're talking about, I think, TNF alpha or something, but it doesn't matter. Um, and then you can also put all of this stuff into a, so this is what an NF kappa B and not beta continuum, but it doesn't matter. Um, the, the friend of mine who wrote that paper was actually talking about this kind of signaling because um, he, uh, he was working in the modeling group and they were trying to figure out they're, they found this new molecule called um, beta TRCP was linked into the system. And they were trying to figure out whether that was a good place to intervene if you wanted to manipulate the downstream genes and, and do pharmacological work. So you have all these different kinds of models of how things look and, and you use those. And then also, you know, that this whole thing, the, the activity of beta catenin is also related to physics. It has to obey the rules of physics. It's, it has the molecules have, have a structure, which explains a lot about how it works. There's biochemical models of how pathways work, um, what can interact with what, what type of signaling system is involved. There's the functional models of what this is all for, which is gene expression. And then of course there's cell biology. And of course, all of this is related to evolution because what's beta catenin? I mean, once you give something a name, you're talking about it in different types of cells, you're talking about different kinds of molecules and different organisms. And so somehow evolution is built into this whole story. And again, each of you has all of this stuff somehow in your head. And what I'm interested in is what it looks like and how you use it when you give talks about beta catenin or because whether you do it well or not is going to depend first on how clearly you see what's in that inner laboratory. So you have all kinds of models that you use and, and each one of them is kind of flawed in a bunch of ways because, because um, none of them is real. You know, none of these look like things really look and we're not even really interested in so much in how things look, but sort of how they interact and function. And if you have a simple text like the one I showed you, you learn how to unpack it and repack it so that other people will understand, so that you understand what it means and so that other people will understand it. And this is really complicated because 
there are all these kinds of assumptions and, and agreements that we make that we don't talk about, but, but to understand this text, we're making those agreements. So when I read this text the first time, the very first thing I asked him was, cells constantly produce beta catenin. What kind of cells are you talking about? He looked at me and he said, oh, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> That's nice. How should I know that it doesn't matter? How do I know what matters and what doesn't matter? Oh, because everybody knows that it doesn't matter. Well, you do and your colleagues do, but actually it does matter because what you're really interested in is cancer and it works differently. The whole system works differently. Anyway, you, you can go on like that. But you see that there's this secret thing that he knew, which was right now in this context, it doesn't really matter what kind of cell I'm talking about because every eukaryotic cell, I guess, has this. Anyway, so, and produce and degrade. My God, what does that mean? What does it mean cells produce the molecule beta catenin? Oh my God, that's a gene expression. Think how complicated gene expression is. Do they always produce it? Under what conditions do they produce it? Do those things matter? Oh no, right now they don't matter. Oh, okay, thanks for telling me. Uh, but you know, as a, as a novice, as a non-scientist, I have to wonder. And, and the text raises the question, do they always do this? It's here in the text. There's when I read a text or when I listen to your talks, everything you say unlocks all of these sort of cascades of, of implications and questions. And I see them because I come in from this perspective of, I really want to understand what you mean. And so that means I need to understand other things. So what are those things? So molecule, are you talking about DNA, RNA or protein? Well, here he's talking about a protein, but it's weird in biology, we use the same name for all three. And so when I started to read papers, it took me a long time to figure out which one of those the scientists was talking about. And sometimes you italicize or capitalize depending on what species you work with anyway. Then beta catenin, is there really such one such thing as beta catenin? Well, everybody has a slightly different flavor of it. You know, we have gene variants and we have different alleles running around and there's different isoforms that the cell makes. And then they talk about these protein complexes. And when I started to hear people talk about protein complexes, I thought, okay, that sounds really good. That's like a little machine. What are the parts of the machine? And they said, well, we don't really know all of them back in the day anyway. And, and when we do know all of them, we don't exactly know structurally how they all fit together because you can't really see that. And anyway, maybe none of these questions that I have about this text, maybe they mat don't matter at all. But maybe they do, or maybe they only do under certain conditions. And all of this only works if you have this model of gene expression, if you have this model of transcription factors. And how does the transcription factor find the target sequence actually for a gene that's trying to activate? Nobody knows. Anyway, <laughs> you see the problem. The problem is, and, and if somebody reads this text in 50 years, they're going to read it and understand it but they'll understand it differently than you did because they have a different laboratory inside. Anyway, then we can even go deeper with this funny little text and we can say, okay, well, all of these things are based on like experiments and data, right? Well, were the experiments good experiments and what kind of data is that? And could you explain the data in a different way? And all of this goes back to the models. And anyway, at some point we're even talking about deeper things like how we think and how brain chemistry works and so on and so on. Now, wow, that sounds all really hard, doesn't it? Um, th this little story that we're talking about is a story about gene expression, right? So if, if I wouldn't, so let, let's, let's assume, assume with me for fun for now that this idea I have of the inner laboratory is, has some kind of reality that you have one and so now I want to investigate it. So how can I investigate that? Well, one way is to take a little tool that I use all the time, and I'll show you the link to get this yourself. It's really cool. It's called a concept map. And you can, you can just take a concept map and you can draw what you know about gene expression. And of course you can write a text, you could write a textbook which explains gene expression. And that would be a text, but. I would have to take that text and then put it into this laboratory and then bring it back out again. And I don't know, the, the laboratory is actually made of biochemical stuff and neuron, neuronal connections and nobody understands it, but 
I, I can use this tool to kind of get a sense of how what I know and how it's related to each other and, and these kinds of things. And the reason I we if if I show you this, we can talk about it. Now I don't know what your inner laboratory model of gene expression looks like. It'll be different than mine. It'll have more stuff because each of these little bubbles you can expand and add details and connect it to more things and so on and so on. But the only way to talk about it is to communicate with you about it. So I can query, I can say, yeah, okay, so explain, explain to me, um, explain to me how splicing works. And if you start to do that, you'll dip into this structure you have in your brain. And you'll say, okay, well, so we have we have genes and they have exons and they have introns. And when the RNA transcript is, I'm just making all this up, I may be wrong. When the RNA transcript is first made, it has all this stuff and parts of it have to be taken out in the nu in the nucleus. I asked somebody that one time, so splicing happens in the nucleus, right? Well, maybe not only in the nucleus, in neurons. Anyway, you see where this is going. So anyway, um, you have this inner laboratory, I have this inner laboratory, and we talk about science, we're comparing those laboratories. And if you don't communicate, there's no way to guess how it's organized and what it looks like. So the point is, communication is there to investigate the structure of my brain, basically. I can, if I write a text, then I see something about how my brain is organized. I'm gonna show you another example of how this works, an even cooler example, okay? We've talked about that one little text until I can't stand it anymore. But so I'm talking about, what we're talking about here is kind of the architecture of your brain and the architecture of the ideas of your brain and the architecture of the science in your brain. So let's look at some real architecture. And here's, here's some real architecture. This is a, a, a layout of the old Bimsby building on the Boo campus, which is now called something else. I'm out of date. I don't know what it is. Anyway, and the architects had to make this specially for me. This, this shows everything. It shows, the walls are in blue, and it shows also the ventilation and the electricity and the water and every single system that's in this building. Um, and if, an, if you gave this to an architect, he would have to peel it apart. He would have to say, okay, that's like a cell, you know, and you're trying to show me everything at once. You're trying to show me the structure, the biochemistry that functions. I need to look at one thing at a time. So you can peel this apart to actually build the building. You have to look at just the electrical and the walls and stuff. But again, I want to investigate. You have something like this in your brain when we're talking about a cell for example, or when you were talking about cancer, okay? And I want to investigate that. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to show you why communication is so important in that process. Um, so this was an example, but it was way too complicated. So I asked my sister to, to draw her house, okay? Just to, to keep this simple. I wanted to learn something about the way my sister's brain works. So I told her, draw your house, and it doesn't have to be really accurate. It doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to show me all the ventilation and the wiring and everything. I just want to know where things are, where the rooms are and so on. So she drew this house. Now, my sister who's much older than I am has grandchildren and she has uh, two twin, identical twin grandchildren. That's important to the story because I needed a control group for the experiment I'm gonna perform. I wanted to see how a child, at the time the twins were eight years old, I wanted to see what would happen when I asked a child to draw the same space. I wanted to see how their brains think about space. This shows me something about how my sister's brain sees space. I wanna know how my children, how these, my nephews uh, see space. So they drew the house. What do you think the house drew, that they drew look like? Now, the equivalent in science is, I want you to give me a presentation about gene expression, and I'm gonna use your presentation to figure out what you, what you think gene expression looks like. Well, here we're talking about a house, something really simple. What does a child think a house looks like? It's, you know, everybody, of course, the child can find their way from the garage to the living room, the kitchen. You tell them, go to the bedroom, they'll find the room. But does space look the same to the child? Here's the first twins drawing. So 
this is interesting. And I'm going to bring up my sister's drawing again, just to compare. This is interesting because things are in the same. He left off the garage. The garage is not important to him. He's eight years old. He doesn't drive yet. And it's a dangerous place because his dad's tools are all in there. Anyway, so the living room is here. The kitchen is here. The boys' bedrooms are back here. There's a bathroom here. There's something here. I guess it's a bathroom and closet and everything. So things are relatively in the same positions to each other. But still, there's a big difference between this drawing and this drawing. Now comes the control group, his identical twin brother. So it's not genetics, OK? Um, here's how his identical twin brother drew the house. And you see also the same thing. Things are in the same place. The kitchen is here. The bedrooms are here. Oops, you compare that to my sister's drawing. Everything is relatively in the same place. But when you do this, you learn something about how the children think. You learn something about how they think about space that you probably wouldn't have known if you didn't ask them to draw it, okay? So you, you see that the children are missing two rules that adults have. And if we, again, when we do this course live and in person, then we can have a little discussion about that because it's kind of interesting. And that is the first rule that they don't know is that, wait, go back. The wall of one room is the back of the wall of the next room. So they should know that this is actually the same as this. They're connected to each other. And you can, this is interesting because you, you can do experiments with a child that really show this. You, you tell them, okay, go into the next room and I'm gonna knock on the wall in this one place. And I want you to guess where the, you're gonna hear the knock. And they, they can't do it. They have no idea where the sound is going to come from. And even if you do that experiment with them and then you have them draw the house, they'll still draw the house this way because something's not connected. So that's one thing you can do. The other thing you can do is interesting because when I was a child, I always wondered whether maybe there weren't like secret rooms or secret passageways in my house where like things were hidden or where I could hide stuff. And if, if this is the way a child thinks of space, then it's real easy. There's all kinds of places where those secret rooms or passageways could be. It's only later when you figure out, okay, the rules are, um, the rooms are connected to each other. The walls are, the back of one room is the back of the wall next door. So then you could measure things to actually determine whether a house looks like this or like this. And the second rule is that if you walk around the outside, the shape has to be the shape of the, everything has to fit into that space. So my question to you is, I mean, again, so the point is just, you only know the children have this strange idea of space and that they don't understand space the same way an adult was if you make them draw it. And if you do these little experiments, but you only think of those experiments if you if you make them draw it. And so you learn that children have a different way of organizing space in their heads than adults do. And so this communication, it exposes what I would call a cognitive ghost. And that is, even if the children intellectually, even if you tell them the wall of this room is the wall next door, they haven't assembled that into a, they haven't pursued the implications of that. They don't have this concept in their head. And so what you learn is that by, so what you learn from the children is that if you make them draw it, you can see things about their mental organization. And so if I make you give a talk or write, I see something about the way you have science organized in your head. And I can use the writing and the talking as a platform to explore that and see, okay, do you have a sophisticated, advanced scientific knowledge of the field? Or how is it organized? Is it may, are there maybe gaps? Are there things missing? And so you can do this exercise yourself. If you write about something or if you draw something, just try to draw the system that you're looking at. And 
you can use that to find gaps and, and find connections that you're not aware of or that you haven't thought about yet. And I'll show you another example of that later. Okay, anyway, the point is that if, if you're gonna communicate well about science, you have to see how this inner laboratory is organized. And the next thing you have to do is you have to make a good guess about how the same information is organized in the minds of the audience. So I'm assuming today, for example, that you know about stuff like transcription vectors. I think that's should, I hope, I hope you do. If not, then we have a problem. You should come talk to me. But, but right at this level of your career and, and starting a PhD at a molecular biology institute, you should have Anyway, I'm, and I'm assuming some things, but I'm not assuming that you know anything about linguistics. I could give this whole talk in using sophisticated linguistic terminology or using other kinds of examples, but I'm, I'm trying to get some points across. So I'm guessing how you have information structured. I'm guessing what I know really well how I want that to be structured in the end. I really know the pattern that I'm trying to give you and I want, and I'm trying to take you between those two points. And so I'm showing you images, I'm giving you text, I'm giving you a little talk to try to show you that structure and to try to give you that structure. And that's actually the point. So what you learn is that if, if we represent this knowledge as a text or an image that shows us where these hidden things are, these hidden structures. And the other thing that's really interesting is it's really worthwhile to try to talk about your work to all different kinds of people not only to experts, because each time you do that, you see different ghosts, you see different patterns that you're actually using to think and organize this stuff, but you haven't actually had to explicitly think about or talk about it. Then, because something will go wrong. And when it goes wrong, it means there's a ghost there. So the biggest ghost, I, I told you at the beginning that most problems that people have when they communicate has to do with the way they think about their work. They don't see this inner laboratory and they don't see how it's structured and they don't take that into account when they're writing a little text. And the second thing that is a real barrier is they don't really agree on what the goal is, okay? So again, you're gonna give a 15 minute talk. 15 minute talk is a long talk. Usually I advise group leaders and institutes when they have students begin their studies to give these talks, it could be shorter, you know, it could be 10 or 12 minutes would be fine. 15 minutes is a lot. So there you are gonna have to make some real decisions about what the goal is. So what's the goal? What am I trying to do with you today? What, 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 what's the goal when you go to a scientific talk and they're presenting their work? Well. We could, again, this would be an interesting thing to discuss and, and you should really think this through for yourself because I'm gonna give you my take on this. And the goal isn't, I don't want you to memorize anything. I, I don't want you, I mean, it's good to know facts and facts are important and, but, but it's not that I want you to, to remember anything exactly that I said. I want you to remember what it meant. I want you to remember the, the point of it. And the test of that is whether you can reproduce it, the listener, whether you can go home and you can say, okay, I'm gonna make some notes about what he said. And, and, and so, so in a talk, I think of it this way. Um, imagine that you give your talk and what's the test of whether it was good or not? So some people like to think, well, okay, if people ask questions, that means it's a good talk. Well, maybe, yeah, if they ask good questions, but I think that's a symptom, that's the phenotype and it's not kind of the, the thing we're really after. And I, I think the goal should be that when you give this talk to this group, you know, the, the beginning students of, from all over Bensby are gonna give this talk. And you want each of them to go away and imagine that somebody's standing outside the room and they all go out in the room and the person outside said, oh damn, I really wanted to hear his talk, but I missed it. What did he talk about? And every person who comes out of that room gives an answer. 
And my test is, are the answers, it doesn't matter exactly what they say, but are the answers, do they mean the same thing? And would the speaker also agree that that's what he or she meant? And so you can even like plan for this in your talk, you know, at the very end of the talk, you could say, okay, well, imagine when you go out of the room that there's somebody standing there and they ask you, what did this guy talk about? Well, here's what I want you to tell him. <laughs> and you could just give it to him, you know, you can pre-digest it. You say, well, the, the second thing is, not only should you have an understanding of, of what was, not only should you understood in a meaningful way what they talked about, but you may be able to use those ideas, okay? And to show you how this works, I'm gonna give you now what I think is a real bad example of science communication. And we're gonna, we're gonna use this example to kind of deconstruct a lot of stuff and, and to show you, we're gonna talk about the ghosts in the story. We're gonna talk about the difference between the speaker or the writer and the audience. And we're gonna talk about how to fix it when it goes wrong. Okay, and, and <clears throat> this text could be like a talk that somebody would give if they hadn't really thought about any of these things. Now, the actual text is from a press release. Uh, I didn't write the original, I'm very happy about that. Uh, it was at the EMBL, the European Molecular Biology Lab in Heidelberg. That's where I worked before I came here. And when I left, they a lot of things kind of went to pieces. That's always nice to, never, never mind. Don't tell anybody I said that. Uh, we have to delete this from the recording, okay? Anyway, <laughs> they started to write press releases and press releases are intended to be taken by a newspaper or a website and published and anyone who comes there should be able to understand the story that they were trying to tell. And I'm gonna just show you what came out of that. And then we're gonna reconstruct that process. And so this was a story about bi-directional transcription from genes and cells, okay? This group had figured out, well, I'll just show you the story and then we'll work backwards. So the title of the story was the title of the press release, which a newspaper is supposed to print so that your grandmother, grandfather, cousins can understand it. It was called Rewrite the Textbooks, Transcription is Bidirectional. I don't know what that would mean to anyone, but anyway, let's just keep going. <laughs> it starts like this. Genes that contain instructions for making proteins make up less than 2% of the human genome. Yet for unknown reasons, most of our DNA is transcribed into RNA. The same is true for many other organisms that are easier to study than humans. Researchers have now unraveled how yeast generates its transcripts and have come a step closer to understanding their function. The study redefines the concept of promoters, the start sites of just transcription, contradicting the established notion that they support transcription in one direction only. The results are also representative of transcription in humans. So we can ask, what does this mean? And we can ask what it means to you. And we can also try to figure out what it would mean to somebody like your grandmother or grandfather or your nearest relative of an advanced age who is not a scientist. Okay, so let's just break this down. And all we're gonna do is ask two, two very simple things. We're gonna ask, what does the sentence mean? And then what connects it to the sentence after that. So look at the first sentence. Genes that contain instructions for making proteins make up less than 2% of the human genome. Yet for unknown reasons, most of our DNA is transcribed into RNA. So what do those sentences mean? And let's, we can even start, it's even easier. What connects the meaning of the, if, if you don't know how this works, how do you know how to connect the information in the first sentence to the information in the second sentence. What's the connection between those two sentences? The, the word yet implies there's a paradox. That, that's very interesting. And we'll get to that, right? So, so 
the word yet is a very interesting word here. I completely agree. But let's just, how do we connect those two pieces of information? What, something's missing, right? Oh, you should, hi. You should yeah. assume that um, the word genome is connected to DNA, but nobody would know that if they're not from that area of profession. Okay, so first of all, that's that's the first thing you need to know, okay? Um, and DNA is the genome and genes are connected to that somehow, good, okay? What else do you also, need to know? And also the, the fact that uh, the RNA is trans in translated in proteins and here they're assuming that all of the RNA is... <laughs> right, so, so th there's the contradiction, okay, so... What's missing is excellent. You got it. You, you got it exactly. And and again, when you read this the first time, you all know that. So these sentences meant something to you. But to somebody who doesn't know those things, so so the first thing that's missing is this DNA, the connection between DNA, RNA, and proteins. Right? As you said earlier, I can't see your names when you talk right now. I'm so sorry. But anyway, DNA and the genome are connected to each other. It has something to do with genes. But there's this central dogma, dogma is Francis Crick said he didn't mean to call it a dogma. He thought dogma meant something different. It doesn't matter, it's a model. And you need to know that you start with DNA and there's this middle step, RNA, right? And then you get proteins. And then we have yet for unknown reasons. And yet for unknown reasons implies not only do you know that that model is there, but that you have some kind of knowledge of the history of that model, because at the beginning, people thought that's the only thing that DNA does. And so, <laughs> yet for unknown reasons, well, they're not unknown to me because I'd never thought about it in the first place, you know, if I'm, if I'm not a scientist. So, do you see how you can, you can, you can stumble right from the very beginning by making assumptions that the person knows the basic terms they know the relationships between those terms but what's missing is the model okay and if you go back to what we talked about before actually your model does not look like this what's in your head what's in your inner library it looks more like this i mean again this is mine and this i did in 10 minutes one afternoon um, when i didn't have anything else to do and i just wanted to see how all the pieces of this system are connected because I was looking at that story and I thought, okay, well, what do I think? That's a gene expression story. So what do I know about gene expression? I just started to put stuff together. And, you know, I know that, for example, transcription machinery, again, each of these little bubbles you can blow up. What's the transcription machine? It's got RNA pull two. It's got, you know, other factors and so on and so on. I had to write a whole story about that one time. And it, it synthesizes, uh, it, it binds to, DNA, you can call it enhancers, promoters, whatever you want. And DNA encodes what I will call pre-mRNA. I don't know what people actually technically call this right now, but this has introns and exons and it has also untranslated regions, UTRs, five prime, three prime UTRs. And um, when it does this, it, it synthesizes, uh, it, it, this encodes non-coding RNA in also microRNAs and so on and so on. And anyway, I just drew all this out because I wanted to see how it was organized in my head. Now, if you have this in your head or something like this, your version will be your own because I learned all this by reading all kinds of different papers and talking to all kinds of people and assembling it in my own personal way. And yours is different than this, I guarantee. And, and again, this is not everything I know and it's been a while, but anyway, so, it's an oversimplified, the system can be connected in all kinds of ways, but to understand that story, you have something like that in your head. So if you go back to it, you say, okay, what are the, all the invisible things this person needs to know in order to understand this story? Well, is that gonna be very helpful? I mean, and, and if you read the story, there's another really, really important point that I want, I want to make sure you all get right now. Okay, so this, this big lights, bold face, important. If I, if I know the system, if I know about gene expression, then what I'm doing when I read this is I'm taking every sentence and I'm mapping it onto some place in this map that I have. 
okay? I'm just plugging it in the relationships I already have and the new piece of information is right here. So they used to think that when the transcription machinery synthesizes RNA, either non-coding RNA or pre-mRNA, it does that in one direction. And now they've found that it can bind to the same site and it can read and transcribe in both directions. That's what the lab found, okay? So I'm just taking this and putting in this one little new piece, changing that to two directions. Okay, if I don't have a system like that, this is the important point. You take the text and you try to build one in your mind. So if you go to a scientific talk where the, the person is a really smart, important professor who's trying to show off how smart they are and they give a talk that nobody's supposed to understand. There, there was one like this at the MDC, a famous case a few years ago. Anyway, they, they come and they give this, or somebody who's trying to really be a big shot and, and they don't care if anyone understands. Then you build, a, you're trying to build one of these structures as you listen to them. If you can't snap it in, then you're trying to build one. And the story you would build with this text is something like this. Um, genes encode proteins. They're a small part of the genome and most are transcribed into RNA. We don't know what the rest. So that's like the first sentence. Genes that contain instructions for making proteins make up less than 2% of the human genome. So you take that information and you build a tree. Now you come to the next sentence. Yet for unknown reasons, most of our DNA is transcribed into RNA. Um, Anyway, I didn't put that here, but you go on. Researchers have now unraveled how yeast generates its transcripts. This redefines the concept of promoters and so on. And so you build these trees. Yeast generates transcripts that have functions, whatever that means. And then you build another tree that says promoters are the start sites of transcription, which were previously believed to happen in one direction. And now that's been contradicted. You, you, the person, if they're, if they're, if they're kind and if they're, they're, they are good willing and they want to learn this, they're trying to build this tree in their minds, but none of these things are linked to each other. And the only way to link them actually is if you look carefully, each one contains the word transcript in, or transcript or transcribed or transcription. And you could say, okay, well, huh, most of our DNA is transcribed into RNA. Researchers have now unraveled how GIST generates its transcripts. Maybe something that's transcribed is a transcript. <laughs> you can make little hypotheses and try to guess how these things are connected to each other. And in the end, you may be able to combine these maps into one system with connections. But will it look the way it's supposed to? Will it mean anything? The person who wrote this text isn't controlling that process because they haven't built the text or the talk in a way, a rational way that the listener could be expected to construct it. So when you give your talk, you may be talking to experts in your field who already, already know everything. And all you're doing is showing them a little part of that story and the connections in it. But you may be talking to people who don't know that system. And in that case, if you want them to remember or reconstruct it, you need to do this better. Now, how can we do that? I mean, I'm not going to be able to tell my grandmother, I'm not going to be able to teach her this in one little text like that. And in fact, I don't know, don't need to. So in fact, I went through that text and I highlighted all the parts of the system that I think you needed to understand that text. So if you want to understand this story, you don't need to understand the whole thing. You need to understand a few of those parts and how they're connected and the pattern that connects them. So the question is, how do we focus and find the key parts of the pattern? And this is now the first real practical link to what you're going to do when you give your talk and, and what you're going to do if you have to write about your project. How, I, I could write about the entire field of molecular biology. No, I'm not going to do that. So how do we focus and find the essential parts? You always start by trying to articulate what you're doing as a question. Everything starts this way. You, so in the second half of this part, we're gonna break off into breakoff groups, okay? Breakout rooms, breakoff groups. I don't know, anyway, something like that. 
And when you get into your little group, which will have three or three or four people in it, each one of you is going to try to phrase your project as a question. And it can be a real specific question. It should be a really specific question. It's not like, how does cancer work or how can we cure cancer? It's like, um, I'll give you an example later and, and I will work with you on your questions. You would be really surprised at the fact that this step is sometimes harder than it looks to actually capture your project as a question. And I also know that some of the projects are open-ended or some of the projects are technological. That's fine. We'll always find a solution, but you're going to try to say articulate as a question. And then the only other thing you need to do is to make sure that people understand what the question means. So what does the question mean? What does that mean? Well, um, why am I asking this question? Why is it important? Why would anyone ask this in the first place? Why do we care? And so the meaning of the question has to do with its relationship to models. So we're studying the system and the system, if, if it understands the way we think it works, then it would make these certain predictions. And so I'm asking a question that will test. Anyway, we'll, we'll, I'll show you that in more detail in just a minute. So, but these are the two steps. We need to figure out what the relationships are to the models and the questions. So in this case, the story was actually this, that what the scientists were actually trying to do was, they said, okay, we're gonna look at, they, these were the early days of transcriptomics when they were getting like the first full readouts from next generation sequencing of the entire RNAs produced by a cell. And so they looked at the sequences and they said, okay, the sequences, since, since DNA makes RNA makes proteins and that transformation, the DNA makes RNA is handled by the transcription machinery. What can we learn about the way the transcription machinery works by looking at the transcripts and comparing them to the DNA sequence? And so what do we learn about the way the transcription machinery works by examining the sequences of all RNAs. And there had been this model that when the tra transcription machinery binds to DNA, it reads in one direction. So it produces a transcript in one direction. What happens if you start at the same place and suddenly you have a transcript going in the other direction? That means the machinery can read and write in both directions. So this is a really precise question. And it's a more, it's a specific question, and it also is involved with more general questions like how do cells produce the molecules they need? How much information is in the genome? How do cells respond to stimuli? Why do they transcribe genes? All those kinds of things related to this. Anyway, but we've got our question now. And then we need to define what the question means, how it relates to models and what the answer says about those models. So we used to have this model that the transcription happened, this machine binds to DNA, it transcribes, it reads, it produces a transcript. And so there's a correspondence between the gene sequence and the RNA transcript. Those two things are connected. Okay. So we've done that. Now, the next question is, how do I explain this story to somebody else? And so, what I need to do then is I need to say, okay, in your case, you have 15 minutes to explain a project to people. And you're at the beginning, so you may not have any data really to speak to, or what you're trying to get is this concept across. So everybody needs to know, every single person in the audience needs to be able to recover from your talk, the question that you're asking. If they can't do that, you fail. <laughs> If they don't know what you're trying to figure out, then they fail. And the second thing they need, all need to know is what the meaning of that question is, why you're asking that question, what it, how it fits into the universe. And those two things are fundamental. And if everybody can go out and say those two things, you've already done it very well. And there's all kinds of ways you can plan to make sure that happens. Okay, so in, in this case, in that story that was so bad in the press release, let's look at this story and let's say, what exactly do we need? What parts of that system do people have to know about really to understand this question that I'm asking? 
And so they need to know that cells have this thing called the transcription machinery and that it binds to DNA. If you want, you can talk about promoters, that's fine. I put that in white because it's, I don't think it's that essential the story right now. So when the transcription machinery binds to DNA sequences, it reads it and it transcribes that into RNA sequences. And there's a correspondence between the DNA sequence and the RNA sequence because of how the machine works, letter by letter, right? Or maybe it skips it, I don't know. Anyway, so we used to think it happens in one direction. And now we found out that it happens in two directions. And if, if the person understands this, then they've understood the story. There's a lot of things they haven't understood, but, but you want people, anyone who reads it should at least be able to retain that and recover it. So if I'm writing this as a press release, this is the hard, this is the worst case scenario, right? Writing for somebody who really doesn't know anything about science. Then there's several things that you do to get from that, this place to that place. And the first thing is, is you, you try to find out whether people know something already that uses the same pattern. Because if, and when I, was a, when I was writing books about science, I would spend most of my time thinking a G protein couple, I'm gonna, I can't, I can't, yeah, I can draw it here. A G protein couple receptor looks like this. This is my great drawing of G protein coupled receptor. It's got seven transmembrane regions. It's got an extracellular domain, an intracellular tail. It passes through the membrane with these seven helices seven, seven times. And I would look at that and I would think, okay, are there, is there something people know that has that shape or has that structure or has that function? And, and just try to associate it. Because you, if you know what a GPCR is, it's a, like I said, it's a receptor that has an extracellular domain, intracellular domain, and seven transmembrane regions. Um, you understand that structure because you have a pattern for it, but you don't see a real one. You have a model of it that you've built in your brain. And because I know that, I know it's not the real thing, then I can try to find something that other people have that's like that. And, and, and give them a similar model in their head. Okay, anyway, so I need to find familiar patterns that people have. Then I need to find the right level to talk to them at. If I'm talking to my grandmother, I have to use a different level. I need to think about this situation. I need to find a way to get into the story and talk about it that's different than if I'm talking to a professor in molecular biology who would laugh at me if I talked about it that way. And then the last thing is I need to engage people. And that is, I need to get them to think with me. I need to get them interested in my project, in my problem. And the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna draw on their interests and draw on their general knowledge. So the first task that you have when we go to the breakout rooms is to define the question, articulate the question you're asking. Then we're gonna, talk about how to translate that into figuring out what the question means. And if there's any time, the next step, which is really important, is to try to figure out a way to get people interested in it. And it's not by telling them that they're gonna die because they'll get cancer someday. How many people, how many millions of people die of this type of cancer? I hate reading that as the beginning of a paper, or hearing that at the beginning of the talk, because it's usually, meaningless in a certain way. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So we need to find a way to get them interested in this topic. So let's go back to our little text. And I'm gonna show you also one other thing that's really interesting. And that is in our, our text about transcription, if you go back and look at this, there's a pattern in here that people already know this is not, we don't only, there's, there's a more basic fundamental pattern in here that people already know and that is, there's a hint of it in the words even and we can use that pattern to talk about it. So the hints are read and transcribe. Those two things have to do with texts. So the basic pattern in this story has to do with reading and writing. So 
let's use a metaphor and let's say we have a machine and it binds to this string DNA. And when it binds there, it reads the letters in the string, another metaphor, the letters. And it, as it reads, it understands those letters and it writes a new text with different letters. Well, yeah, corresponding letters. And we used to think that happened in one direction, like a text, like English is in one direction, but now we know it happens in two directions. So you can read the text forwards and backwards. Because I see that there's this pattern of reading and writing in there. Now I can write the story in a completely different new way. And I'll show you just a real quick attempt to write that story. And that is, first of all, I changed the title. Our DNA can be read backwards and forwards. And now I'm gonna try to engage them. I'm trying to get them into the story by linking it to something interesting that they might know or be curious about or want to know, or just a fact that they didn't know that's kind of interesting. And that is, I'm putting it into a context. Our cells specialize and cope with the challenges of life by producing different sets of molecules. They do this by drawing on different recipes in their DNA that they use to build RNAs and then proteins. This process begins when a cellular machine scans DNA and locates the instructions it needs for a particular molecule. The machine attaches itself at the beginning, reads it, and transcribes it letter by letter into an RNA molecule. Until now, scientists have thought that the recipes only made sense when read and transcribed in one direction like this text. But scientists at Embel have now found that when it binds, the machine can often read and transcribe in both directions. So I've told the whole story. I've given them the whole pattern. I've given them all the pieces. And now I can e even talk about the science a little bit. I can, I can say how they did it. And I can also talk about what it means. And you know, interestingly, when people read a story like this, they can usually draw a very logical conclusion from it. And they can also ask a really logical question. So the question that they would ask is, if, if you really imagine having making a little machine that, that you know, like you, you have a, a, a Tech, or you have a text on a strip of paper and the machine goes to that paper and it reads it and it can read it either left or right. Well, the question they're gonna ask is, how does it know which way to go, right? And looking at just this little, very simplified, very metaphorical version of the story, they can ask that question and that's a good scientific question. I mean, you could, you could turn that into a project is figuring out how the machine knows whether to read left or right. So by telling the story this way, I've gotten people to understand it well enough to ask a smart question. And the other thing that they can do is they can see the implications. Well, I have my grandmother's recipe book here. And now I discover that there's not only recipes read from left to right, but you can also read recipes from right to left. Oh, that means there's at least twice as much information in that recipe book, right? It's also a logical conclusion. And in fact, there's even more because you can have things read through other things and so on. So anyway, telling the story this way has many, many, I mean, again, it's more likely that people will remember it. Oh, we have these machines that can read our DNA in two directions. Um, and it's also, they'll understand it, they'll understand the implications and they'll put it into a context better. So the parts of this are engagement. Why is this relevant to anything or interesting? Well, the first, I try to hook this, hook them to this by, by telling them a fact that they may not know, but that's important. And then I tell them how that happens. So I, I'm just trying to get them interested. And then I use familiar patterns, which have to do with all these things about text. I use a machine and instructions and code and transcription and recipes. And then I tell the real story. I really want to tell people what exactly they found. And what I hope they'll go from this is an idea of what it means, the implications. And, and so this is what you're trying to do with pe people not from your field, with, with non-experts and so on. So, I'm going to just do two more little things before we take our break. And that is, now we need to take this, and I, I want to show you this really cool thing about why doing this text in this way for non-scientists 
could be really important to your thinking as a scientist. And that is your inner laboratory is filled with patterns and images and stories and structures and little films. They're not real, they're metaphors. And if you understand that, you can play games with that in those laboratories. You can, you can do experiments in the mental laboratory that may then give you experiments for the real laboratory. And I'll just show an example. And so, as I told you, we, we, used, we used the metaphor of, I can't get my computer to work here. Yeah, so we used the metaphor of reading reading a, a cookbook or reading a text. So let me think about reading. That's the pattern that I have for transcription. It's a reading pattern. So let's think about reading. What are things that happen when I read? Well, <laughs> when I read a book, I skip boring passages sometimes. I have to admit, I shouldn't, but I do. Or if I don't understand something, I go back and I reread the sentence or I underline an important passage or I take notes or I may get interrupted by a phone call and then come back and I you know I dog ear the pages of my book my, my wife hates that but I do it when I read because I stop and then I go back or I reread a few pages I look something up okay so I've told you that in my mind I'm thinking of transcription like a process of reading and writing does a biological machine does the transcription machinery do any of these other things well the only reason I thought of asking those questions was because I was thinking of reading and writing. So if, if I see that I have this pattern, then I can play with it and I can say, okay, does the scientific system also works this way? And every time we do this course and people start to work with metaphors and people start to write press releases and those kinds of things, we come up with these patterns and we discover that we are generating questions based on the patterns that the person hasn't thought of actually doing the experiments before. And I have to say that in my work with scientists at the NBC, I have come up with questions. In fact, I'm an author of a paper that was my own idea because I used the system to generate a question that nobody asked about evolution before. And um, we got a paper out of it and it got published and I was very happy. So it has some practical results. The other thing that's happening when you do this process is We'll come back to this in a minute, but, but realize that the meaning of the question you're asking is somehow related to models. I'll come back to this when we start the next part. But let me just show you one other thing. And this, this is, how do I go from a real specific scientific question that I have to communicating it in a talk or communicating with scientists or communicating with non-scientists. How do I figure out what's the right level and how do I figure out how to break this topic down into parts that make sense? And I use this diagram that I'm gonna show you now in all of my courses. I use it when we talk about writing a thesis or writing a paper or other things because this chart is really interesting in, in certain ways. So let's look at this was an actual thesis process a, a project of somebody and they were asking what is the structural basis by which beta catenin binds to dna now that was the the sort of general question and they were asking specifically about they wanted to know what the features of its protein structure were um what interaction partners it used when it binds to dna what conformational changes it underwent or needed to undergo to bind to those different partners and how those changes influenced binding to different sequences because what they're really interested in is how this one transcription factor targets so many different genes and different sets of genes in different contexts. So how to explain its specificity in binding on a structural basis and on in terms of secondary structure, tertiary structure, and quaternary structure. Okay, so that's the specific question they were asking. And their assignment in the course was not only to work on their thesis, but they were also supposed to figure out a way to explain this to their grandmother. So I always use grandma, I should use great uncle or something, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Anyway, so there, this is really easy, but you have to, and it has all kinds of effects, but you have to figure out how it works. So you have to realize 
again, what's the reason that you're asking this question? And this is a real specific question, but it's also an example of more general questions. So basically we're asking, how does this specific transcription factor work? And the reason we're asking that is because we want to understand how does a cell know which set of genes to activate using that transcription factor. And that process happens during specialization, adaptation, it also happens during disease. So during these different processes, beta catenin functions in different ways with different effects, and it has different functions in stress responses or when the environment changes. And that's a more specific way of asking an even more general question, and that is how do cells respond to environmental or signaling changes. For example, when they're trying to specialize and how do they get from one basic cell type into all the hemiploidic types of cells or whatever. So the reason why we made this chart is because first of all, scientifically, as you're working on this question, you're also working at some level on all of these other questions at exactly the same time. So you may find out something really specific about beta catenin, but it may also show you a general principle about a transcription factor or gene activation. And at the very beginning, I told you great scientists are often really good communicators. And I think the reason the connection is they see how any given question is related to a lot more topics and they've picked a great question to not only answer this specific thing but to answer some very fundamental question about all these other levels because you're you're testing what we know about this molecule but you're also testing our models of specialization the models of a particular disease all of those things are coming to play and when you write the introduction to your thesis and when you write the discussion your thesis you're gonna actually say, well, I've learned something about this one molecule, but I've also learned something more general about this thing on the side and these other levels. So you see how they're connected. And the last thing I'm gonna say from the break is just to show you how this helps communicate to your grandmother because now we've got also a communication path. I can say, grandma, you know, you have reproduced in your lifetime, otherwise I wouldn't be here. So you know that we all start off as this one little cell in, in, in you. And, and that cell, you know, it grows and it divides to become a whole person. And if you look at the cells in a whole person, you see there are all kinds of different ones. There's like red blood cells, which look like donuts. And then there's nerve cells, which look like big trees with roots and, and branches. And, and then there's muscle cells, which look like little pistons and so on. And but they all start from the same cell. So how does that one cell know to become all those different types? Well, it has a recipe book. All cells have the same recipe book, but they use different recipes and make different stuff. So they turn out different. And the reason they know which recipes, the reason one cell uses different recipes than another cell is because cells produce these things called transcription factors, which are kind of like the they, they go into the recipe book and they tell it which ones to use or not. And what I'm doing in my research is I'm looking at one of these recipe reading transcription factors and I'm trying to figure out how it knows what page to look at, how it knows what help it needs from other cooks or, or recipe finders to, to activate that information and use that information and to cook up what it needs to cook. So, this, this structure gives you a view of the science, but it also gives you a view of the communication, every communication strategy you can use. Now, if you're talking to advanced career scientists, you're not gonna start by saying, no, you all know we start as a single cell. You're gonna start by saying, we, there's, there are interesting questions that are still open about how transcription factors achieve the specificity that they need to do all of these different functions in all these different uh, contexts. And the one that I'm interested in is a really interesting one because it's, it's called beta catenin, which you obviously have heard of before. And I'm working at it. So again, all we've done now, all I've done is instead of starting up here, I've entered the chart down here. I, I'll tell you a little bit about which, you know, what disease or whatever I'm working on, but I'm gonna get into the details. And that's just because you, you all know that stuff in the audience. And so I start here. 
So again, this, this type of chart has two functions. It maps out your topic. And ideally, each of you, before you give your 15 minute presentation, you will have worked out a map like this. And the map will have the exact question you're asking, but it'll also chart out some of these relationships between things. And, and it'll show how that fits into a hierarchy of, of more general questions. And you'll also work, have worked out a map of that's kind of like this which shows the parts of the system that you're need, you're going to actually need to explain and the way that you're going to need to construct that for the audience. Again, the audience may have a fairly sophisticated map of what you're talking about, and then you can just highlight the pieces that you need and show remind them how they're assembled and how they're connected to each other. But you're going to if you have this most communication tasks get really easy somehow if you think about it this way. Okay, it's time for a break. I, I am exhausted. I need some Red Bull or something powerful now. Um, what I'd like you to do now is take a break, 10 minutes, 